So it's going to be really, really good. So thanks for joining this evening. And what the first uh, is our first EDA presentation event um, and our first on the important topic of mental well-being. Before I formally introduce our speakers, uh, David Komiski and Tom Shore, I just want to take this timely opportunity to tell you a wee bit about our Equality, Diversity, Inclusion Task Force, or EDI for short. It goes without saying, especially when you see what's happening around the world at the moment, that these times have demonstrated how important equality, diversity and inclusivity is within our society. Uh, and as part of my inaugural presentational uh, speech uh, in November, uh, when I became your president, I, I spoke about the importance of this work. And earlier uh, last year, we set up the Institute's Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Task Force. Obviously, we had a really good response from those who, who wanted to be part of this group. And we have since had our inaugural meeting uh, and we're making great strides in the preparation of our new updated policies and whatnot. Promoting and supporting equality and diversity in the architectural technology community is vitally important because it's about valuing each member as an individual. It's critical to have an inclusive environment where every member feels able to participate and achieve their potential. We all know that there's UK legislation covering age, disability, race, religion, gender and sexual orientation, amongst others, uh, that already sets minimum standards. Our effective um, EDI strategy goes beyond that uh, and that's legal compliance and seeks to add value to the Institute, which has subsequently contributed to our members' well-being and engagement. It's important to note that equality uh, of opportunity will only exist when we recognise and value difference and actively work together for inclusion. CIAT is committed to making architectural technology a diverse and inclusive pro profession uh, and, and representative of the societies that our members work within to create a safe environment for the architectural technology community. We work with and support our members to maximise their potential as architectural technology professionals, no matter what their background, knowledge, skills and experience, uh, with an equal opportunity to thrive and progress. We strongly condemn any form of racism, harassment or bullying, uh, and we're committed to driving change on equality, diversity and inclusion in the architectural technology profession and the Institute. And of course, the Institute is dedicated to support any member through their membership progression and accommodate any specific requirements or assistance that they may have. If being part of this wonderful EDI task group is something that you'd be interested in, or if you would like to more, know more about the aims of what the EDA task force is, then please email Adam Endicott, our communications director, at a.endicott at ciat.global, or myself at president at ciat.global. You can also get direct links to our email addresses on the who's who section of our website uh, at architecturaltechnology.com. Now, there's been uh, a few really good CIAT articles uh, published over the past year or so on tonight's topic of mental well-being. They've been prepared via our special issues task force uh, with pretty incredible contributions from a raft of, a raft of our members, but especially from uh, Niall Healy and David Komiski, who's with us tonight. Some of the most recent pieces have covered the difficulties that members are having during the pandemic and the lockdown. If you haven't had a chance to see them, uh, you can see them in the summer 2020 edition of our AT Journal, which again can be accessed via uh, the website. So without further ado, the CIAT Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Task Force, in conjunction with David Komiski, NCIT, and Tom Shore from the Architects Benevolent Society are delighted to present tonight's presentation titled Changing Attitudes Towards the Mental Wellbeing of early career AT professionals. This session will focus on the important topic of mental well-being uh, of early career professionals within the AT sector. It will provide suggestions which are designed to help individuals make small changes which can make a big difference to their own lives and the lives of others as well as discussing the help that's available. 
It's now my pleasure to introduce to you David Comiskey, MCIET. David is a chartered AT and a senior lecturer in architectural technology within the Belfast School of Architecture and the Built Environment at Ulster University. He is a CIET Northern Ireland Regional Committee member and nationally he sits in both the CIET Special Issues Task Force and the EDI Task Force. His other roles include being a CIET Professional Interview Assessor and Accreditation Panel Chair, an external examiner at the Technological University in Dublin, and he also sits on a range of international conference and scientific committees. David is also an ambassador for the Architects Benevolent Society. His role this evening is to discuss the outcome of a project undertaken uh, on behalf of the CIET Specialist Task Force related to the mental well-being of young and early career AT professionals. David, the floor is yours. Addy, thanks for your, your kind words. You seem to, you, need, you know me better than I know myself, um, going by that introduction. Um, just while your mic's on, I'm just going to check that everybody can see my screen um, whenever I try to share it. So if you can let me know that that's come through OK, Addy? That's lovely. Thank you, David. Perfect. Perfect. I was going to start off by saying um, that if you hear any background noise, I apologise. It's it's my kids' bedtime, um, but I think that's that's pretty normal in every household now, and especially with the the talk tonight being around uh, mental well-being and thinking of COVID and the, the different situation we're all in. I don't think anybody's apologising for that anymore. It's just it's just par for the course at this stage. Um, but again, thanks so much, Eddie, for your, your kind introduction, your kind words. And I'm delighted to be here tonight um, to, to present to you on this really important topic. So, as Eddie said, my name is David Comiskey. I'm a senior lecturer at Ulster University and also proud to be an ABS ambassador. Um, and I know Tom will, will talk more about the, the excellent wor work of ABS later on in the, the session. So tonight, I suppose I'm presenting on behalf of the um, Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Task Force. Um, but it's the outcome of work that was undertook on behalf of a different task task force, the Special Issues Task Force, um, so sort of wearing both hats. But where this really came from, I suppose, as a, a group, we recognise that whilst there's been some fantastic work undertaken in relation to reducing the, the stigma around mental health and well-being in construction, um, it, it's maybe fair to say a lot of the focus over the last couple of years has been maybe site-based on tradespeople, or those regularly working on or visiting construction sites. And there was potentially, we felt a slight gap in terms of guidance and good practice for early career professionals and for their um, employers or mentors or la line managers and potentially academics as well who are already dealing um, with the, the early career professionals. So um, really for all of the aforementioned Taking an interest in the well-being of, of early career professionals is important. Was research, as we'll come on to, has shown that individuals are prone to, to mental health um, problems during life transitions. And one of those life transitions is moving from academia or their, their university education into the real world, um, essentially, and into adulthood, I suppose. So it's really, really timely topic and I hope you take a lot from it tonight. I'm conscious that there are students on the call, there are employers, um, I think there's some academics as well, so I'll try to be as, as wide ranging as possible um, and cover as many different topics and uh, topic areas as possible within the, the set time. So the work that we undertook resulted in the publication or the, the front cover of the publication, which can be seen on screen. And I will provide a link um, in the chat later or I'll, I'll ask Adam to send around a circular so people can download this and read it for themselves. But the desired outcome, so what we really wanted to do was to ensure those acting in a, in a leadership or mentor capacity um, were aware of the statistics and had a basic understanding of the potential reasons why instances of mental um, well-being are, are on the rise or mental health issues are on the rise, the differences that they can make in their organisations, and really just have an awareness of the help and support which is available um, and maybe the, the good practice tips that can help them as well. 
and we wanted to share a good practice for for the students, for the, the young professionals, for early career professionals, for academics and for employers as well. And I think at the outset, it's important to stress that I have no formal training of any sort in counselling and psychology or anything to do with, with mental health or well-being. I'm really approaching this first and foremost as a, a chartered architectural technologist and someone who has spent probably the last 12 to 14 years um, in academia, working with students, um, going out on placement visits, uh, dealing with with a lot of firms in terms of graduate and uh, uh, graduate level jobs and placement jobs as well. But for this publication, I did work with experts from different sectors, so students, um, people from the mental wellbeing team at Ulster University, CIAT colleagues, some of whom are on the call tonight, um, especially Niall and Addy, and numerous others. So we wanted to make sure that the final outcome was appropriate and met the needs or the set aims and objectives, I should say. So over the next 20 minutes or so, what I aim to, to cover um, is really just to touch on the evolution of the, the AT discipline. I'm conscious that there are employers in, um, some of whom may be from a, an architecture rather than architectural technology or construction background. So just to give them a feel for what the education sector is like. Um, and even for architectural technology, technologists, you know, some of whom have, have been out of university for 10, 15, 20 years. And it's, you know, it's easy to lose track uh, of what is actually going on within the, the university setting. I'll then briefly touch on student life in the 21st century and um, look at the statistics and the construction sector and then focus really on the model of support. So what's the good practice tips and advice that we came up with? And again, what you as individuals or organizations can do to, to help um, in this process. So really to start off with, and I want to acknowledge the graphics in this presentation who, that were produced by a final year student of mine last year, um, Chi Tang. So it's some excellent work. This is always worth acknowledging that. But when developing, um, this work we wanted to come up with a metaphor which aligned with what we were trying to achieve and essentially that was encouraging individuals and reassuring them that they can open up and chat about small worries and concerns they may have before they may snowball into something much greater and it was really to provide some ideas on how to do this as well as guidance for early career professionals employers and academic staff so the metaphor we, we came up with was aligned back to architecture, architectural technology and a minor or relatively minor construction defect, such as a bridged cavity or incorrectly installed one wall tie, if ignored, can lead to more serious issues requiring specialist remedial treatment. And really just uh, there are parallels with our own lives, I suppose. If, if we have small worries and concerns and let them linger and develop, Unless we know how to learn and deal with them, um, they can really build and snowball into something more serious. And the longer we leave it, the more difficult it is to fix. So I thought that was a nice metaphor to, to start off with, especially with the, the topic areas um, we're, we're dealing with tonight and the subject areas. So as I said, many employers are, either, are from a, maybe an architecture or construction background, an AIT background, but have left um, university for a number of years. So it's, it's worth just touching on this, I feel that the evolution of the, the architectural technology discipline, how it's moved on uh, leaps and bounds over the last number of years, but the impact that's had on the, the education sector as well. Um, so even from my own perspective at Ulster University, you know, over the last few years, we've seen graduates move um, maybe even before that, whenever I came through 10 or 12 years ago, the traditional route was to um, undertake your degree and then go out and work in primarily architectural practice as a technologist, um, sort of specialising in, in the technical side of architecture. That's what I and I suppose most of my cohort would have done, but over the last, I suppose, four or five years, we're seeing more and more graduates moving into different roles, whether they be specialist technical roles, um, digital technology roles, um, BIM roles, information managers. So we're seeing such a diverse um, 
the students, the graduates have such a diverse skill set, they're moving into more and more sectors which are, which are aligned to architectural technology, but not necessarily into that architectural practice. And I suppose what I'm saying is that the education sector has moved on over the last few years, and we're trying to um, make sure that the students have the skill set to move into those positions as well. And it's very different to what would have been delivered previously. So again, as always, you're going to have the core competencies that include technical detailing, sustainability, legislation, inclusivity, et cetera. I'll not read them verbatim. But on top of that, the students are more and more using the more complex sort of authoring or modeling software, analysis software, looking at implementation processes from that digital perspective, different standards, different protocols, information management um, systems, common data environments. So all this on top of everything else that you would expect of an architectural technology student. We're also pushing the boundaries. We're expecting them to be innovators, model makers, both physical and virtual, problem solvers, research has really come to the fore in architectural technology, um, the academic writing skills that they need to, to develop um, to be able to communicate effectively. And those soft skills are a really key, key graduate trait that more and more employers are looking for. So I suppose in summary, what I'm trying to say is that the education sector is so exciting. I wish I was 10, 15 years younger to, to, to be taught what we are now teaching in the course. But it's, I suppose, in terms of workload, in terms of the time commitment, um, the challenge, uh, it is challenging from that perspective. And that is that is faced alongside growing external and, and social pressures, I suppose. And what I mean by that, and it just alludes or leads nicely into the, the slide on student life in the 21st century. And I'm not going to, to talk to the students in the, the virtual audience here tonight because they know that the trials and troubles they have themselves. But just more generally, um, again, maybe aimed at the employers, it's really difficult to compare, I suppose, today's students with what we experienced, even going back 10 years or so. It's completely different. And it maybe it took me to, to, to work on this document and the research to fully appreciate that. So things like rising tuition fees, especially in, in England, um, accommodation costs, general subsistence means that many students need to work more than they study just to exist. So if you think about a full time undergraduate degree program, essentially students are expected to, to work full time 35, 40 hours a week um, to, to get through the course successfully. But, you know, with more and more students and just anecdotal evidence coming to me and saying, you know, David, I can't do that. If, if I if I can't work part time or over the weekends or during nights, I just can't um, afford to go to university. I just I'm not in that privileged position. So more and more students are really having to balance the, the, the work and it's becoming more full time than part time roles with their studies. And again, this can lead to really unhealthy work life balance and stress and illness. There's pressures from maybe parents or employers who are paying fees and while students in that position are privileged, it's a great deal of stress on them to get that first class honours or get the high marks that their parents or employers feel they should be getting. With the ageing population, more and more have caring responsibilities. Um, and the big one, just jumping through some of this, is the, the social media pressures to conform. Um, it's really came through clearly as part of this work and from speaking with the students. And as it's sort of as succinctly put on the, the slide on the screen, that this is a generation born with a phone in their hands, bombarded with filtered images, pretend lives, and it's 24 seven. No day off, no relief from it. And I suppose I'm just thankful that I grew up whenever, you know, there really was no social media or it was only starting and Bebo was just starting for anybody. Um, of my age that can remember that. Um, so that pretend lives is a big thing too, where you have maybe students seeing their peers from the outside, it looks like they have the perfect life, um, no money issues, um, brilliant nightlife, all this is pre-COVID of course. Um, and just getting those snapshots on Instagram or whatever they're thinking, you know, why is our life perfect and mine's not? And whenever you, you dig into it, you know, it's it's, it can be very superficial and what you're seeing on social media isn't necessarily telling the, the true story, but um, again, it is a, a big issue. And again, you have more mature students now, which is fantastic, but that can lead to financial stresses. 
can lead to added stress and isolation. Um, and there's a move generally in education towards more self-directed learning, which again can exacerbate feelings of isolation and raise stress levels. So again, just to, to set um, the scene as much as anything else, so a driver for the development of this work was really the sobering statistics relating to the mental well-being of the, the next generation of young and early career professionals. And whenever we considered that alongside the statistics relating to the construction sector. Um, and the pressures which are faced by today as students, both during and after university, coupled with those social and personal pressures means that more and more are struggling to cope with um, what is known as the normal stresses of life. And I have put a, a definition from the World Health Organization on what we mean by that and what we mean by, by mental health um, when we talk about it. And from my perspective, really, as a responsible professional, it's important to be aware of the social trends um, and as I always say, in work as in life, everyone has different trigger points and stress holding capacity. And it's really, really important to keep this in mind with inner dealings with others, whether that be me as an academic or an employer or even students um, dealing and chatting with other students. It's really, really important. And it doesn't mean that young professionals should be treated differently or given less responsibility. Absolutely not. Um, this guidance is really just suggesting that, you know, that there's an awareness of the importance of mental well-being. Um, and a supportive culture where individuals feel they won't be stigmatized if they face such personal challenges. And that's the big thing we want to get out of this, just to to to, to let people know it's okay to feel feel like that. It's okay to, to start conversations and just chat about your, your feelings, your emotions. So for young professionals, we wanted to get across the message that it is okay to reach out and ask for help if you if you need it. So on screen are some of the stats from a 2018 university mental health survey, um, and I think they're useful both to highlight the issues faced, but to make young professionals or students know that they're not alone if they're having or have had similar feelings. So very quickly, uh, of those that responded to this survey, and it was a pretty extensive survey throughout the UK, 34% um, experienced a serious personal, emotional, behavioural or mental health problem for which they needed professional help. 22% received a mental health diagnosis. 43% outlined they were always or often worried. Um, half of the respondents reported some thoughts of self-harm and three quarters concealed their sim symptoms for fear of stigmatization. And I suppose that's really what we're trying to, to work on with publications like this. Additionally, some findings from research undertaken at Ulster, my own university, as part of a, a larger global study. And it was shown that 50% of new entry students, again, who responded to the survey, stated that they had experienced a mental health issue at some point in their life. Almost a quarter screened positively for a mood disorder and over a fifth had an anxiety disorder. Nearly a third reported having suicidal thoughts, whilst almost 20% said they had made a suicide plan. And I think that's what really hit home to me when I read that. You know, it's 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 really it's really scary whenever you, you, you read that and you see such stats. And I suppose prompted me to, to push on and work on this and produce something that will hopefully make some sort of a difference even to one person. Um, and then the, we had additional research as part of this we looked at, um, which showed that young LGBTQ plus people have higher rates of poor mental health, um, self-harm and suicide than their non-LGBTQ plus counterparts. So it's useful again to provide those statistics to, to really set the scene. And this must be considered against a backdrop of the construction sector historically having a poor track record. Although, as I acknowledged earlier, that that is thankfully changing. But looking at stats between 2011 and 2015, um, it showed a higher suicide rate in skilled construction and building trades than in any other sub-major occupation listed. Um, a more recent 2019 study identified stress, depression, anxiety as accounting for just over one fifth of work related ill health in the construction sector in GB. And then looking at architecture and architecture students, um, some excellent work by Melissa Kirkpatrick. The findings from that illustrated that 33% of respondents to a survey believe they had a mental health problem, which is higher than the rate within the UK general population. 
with students studying the architecture discipline more um, likely to experience mental distress when compared to the typical student. There was also another study we looked at, a US study, which showed um, architecture to be a high risk um, discipline in relation to, to suicide as well. And the big thing is that many of these students that, that screened positively are reluctant to seek help, and that's what we want to try and address as well. Um, the Ulster University survey showed that um, only 10% of students who screened positively for a mental health problem received professional help, and there were large gender differences with only 5.3 male students seeking help compared to 13.8% of female students. And more generally, from a business perspective, you know, there's um, there is it makes business sense to have happy uh, employees and to really take this seriously and do all they can. Whenever you look at the, the number of work days lost per annum due to mental illness, um, you know, it's it is. Um, staggering whenever you, you read the stats and I think to summarize before we move on to the model of support um, the background summary is really identify graduates of today as being from a generation which have a high potential for mental health issues it's especially true in the architecture subject area and they're entering a, an industry which traditionally has had a poor track record in relation to to mental well-being and mental health so it could be described as the perfect storm and to me it's remiss not to acknowledge that to raise awareness of the subject and then act upon the the research stats so what we done to, to try and do our part or play our part was develop a model of support which was really over three levels so first of all university support so what could be done within the university context or setting to help um, students on their journey and again what those students can do to help themselves in level two so you know be prepared how can they get ready for professional practice and then the third level was looking at that practice level support and both self-care for management so we felt that before you can be in a position to help others you have to know how to look after yourself and have those good processes and good thought processes um, and then the, the practice level support that goes on par with that so what I'm going to do, I'm just going to pick out some of the, the key points here. Um, I will direct everybody to this document to read it afterwards, um, but it's worth just spending maybe a minute or so on each slide as we go through it. So first of all, the level one university support. Um, it's really important from an academic perspective that the institution gives the, the academics who are dealing and facing and chatting to the students every day and um, the training and support that, that they need that we need um, to be able to advise and encourage students accordingly so we sort of acknowledge that and there's numerous things we, we felt could be done within that space um, in terms of day-to-day -day activities and preparation from for the world of work this really starts from day one um, with whenever the students enter the university so with things like even at induction promoting mental health mental well-being physical well-being the importance of it having an open approach talk freely about you know mental health and you know normalize it so that people aren't afraid to, to approach you Embedding resilience in all modules, um, some really nice work done by the Higher Education Academy who talk about embedding mental well-being in the curriculum. So how you can very, very um, subtly drop in aspects within your teaching practice and sort of open up a, a discussion and engage a discussion, which is some nice work, which is cited and referenced there. You can read um, if, if it's of interest to you. And even things like students preparing for placement that they um, to try and foresee any potential or future problems that they know what their working hours are, they have an understanding of that, what their weekly wage or monthly wage is going to be so they can make financial plans, etc. and just really get them as ready as they can be for the, the world of work. And we also talked about working with employers and placement providers, building that relationship with the universities or, or colleges, um, just to again really a good practice. Ensure employers are aware of support offered by likes of the Architects Benevolent Society as well, and um, just small aspects like that. Then in terms of readiness for professional practice, including self-care, um, again, we have outlined here what students in this case, or it could be young and early career professionals, could do to, to help themselves. And that's you know developing a network of support. 
um, developing a professional LinkedIn presence and network just to, to build that rapport, build those relationships as well. Um, so there's less of a chance of, of isolation or more people they can speak to. Um, if people, if students have a, a long term or a, a medical condition or a disability that they have the, the needs assessments that they're entitled to undertaken at the university and just make sure they're aware of that. In terms of graduate roles, um, again, thinking about the, the finance side of things, thinking about the if the students are going to go internationally, that the, they've worked everything out, out beforehand and the, they're ready to go. Uh, um, the resources pinpoint them to, to key resources as well. And then whilst on placement, the support that can be provided. So um, again, keeping in contact with the university, with their peers, pointing them to some publications, some websites that are, are, are really good in this space, and even to set things like weekly goals, which may be small in nature, and celebrate these. So it could be something as simple as becoming familiar with a new detail or a new material or a specification writing exercise or just something that they feel they've got satisfaction from and it's a small win to them and just really promote that and encourage it. And finally, then from the employers or from the practice support perspective, what can be done to make that uh, the experience, the, the, the transition from university to professional practice as easy as possible and help people and students settle in. So it's things like ensuring mental well-being is addressed in the recruitment and selection process. It's part of the onboarding experience. Um, things even as simple as having a poster in the, maybe the, the lunch area, the canteen, promote Mental Health Day, World Mental Health Day every year, have lunchtime CPD sessions that, that discuss mental well-being, physical health maybe cover aspects like financial planning that could really help someone out. Um, and just generally have an encouraging atmosphere, maybe have a mental health champion within the, the team as such, have induction bodies who reach out to the, the students or graduates prior to starting in case of any questions and talking through the process and chat through what they'll be doing over the first month or six months, etc. And a lot of these I suppose good practice tips are just that they're small, relatively small things that you know any practice could do just to, to make that transition a wee bit easier. And as I mentioned earlier, you have that self-care for management where you know you need to know your own limitations, you need to look after your own I suppose, mental well-being, physical well-being before you can really um, reach out and, and fully and truly help others. So again, there's so much I could talk about. I just wanted to give a snapshot and then direct people to the publication to, to really please take time to read through it. And what I would ask or what I would love out of this session tonight is um, we're targeting this at the employers. Um, I would love as many of you as possible to sign up to what we have called the mindfulness pathway to really pledge your commitments, to play in your part and making a difference. So this means taking a pledge to incorporate three, any three of the suggestions that were shown on screen or even your own suggestions and incorporating those within your own organisation. And what we did, we wanted to make this sort of like a live document. So within the document, there's a QR code or there's a link you can go to um, or I'll get it sent out afterwards. But you can click on it. You can literally take one minute to pledge your commitment. And then there's a list of practices who have signed up um, to this mindfulness pathway um, that are visible to anybody that's reading the document because whenever they click on the link you get a list of those that have signed up so we already have practices in republic of ireland northern ireland england and um, scotland gibraltar who have signed up to this good practice pathway and i would really encourage everybody to, to do that tonight i'll try and put a link into the chat bar and um, but i'll ask adam to, to send it out afterwards really um just to summarize useful links that the document has in its conclusion a page or two pages of useful links uh, sort of additional and supporting resources but i just wanted to pick out one of them that i think is fantastic it's the architects mental well-being forum and the, the toolkit that they have developed and it also includes a covid19 toolkit which is really really timely and an excellent resource so i'm conscious i'm just uh, slightly over my time and I don't want to eat into to Tom's time because he's going to discuss the, the excellent work of the ABS. So really just to, to thank you for, for taking your time out of your busy schedule this evening to join the session and listen to me and hope that you have got um, something from that. So I'm going to stop sharing Eddie and hand back to you if that's <clears throat> that's okay.
Thank you, David. Um, uh, just to reiterate, listen, thank you. What, what a brilliant, wonderful presentation. The document's incredible, obviously, uh, with our involvement with the Special Issues Task Force. I've had a, a, a chance to review it many times. Can I just say, you're going to share this link to the document with everybody. Please take an opportunity uh, to, to read and review it. There, there's things in it that you'll see uh, that you, you may think you already know, uh, and when you see it, you're gonna. It's gonna make such a, such a difference to your attitude towards it. It's it's really remarkable. Uh, and a seamless link, David. A perfect fit to follow on. Uh, I'd now like to introduce Tom Short, um, who is a supporter relations officer for our dear friends at the Architects Benevolence Society. <clears throat> CIAT is delighted and proud of its long continued association uh, with ABS. Uh, and our network of ABS ambassadors that do an incredible job fundraising and, and raising awareness of the many kinds of support that is available to the wider architectural community and their families in times of need. We make no secret the fact that our work is, is in a demanding environment and sometimes these demands can take their toll and detrimentally manifest themselves in many forms. And to this end, it's absolutely incredible to know that ABS is there to offer help and support to those in our profession who may be experiencing difficult times. Tom, the floor is yours. <laughs> thank you so much. It's a very nice introduction. And um, thank you, uh, David. That was really informative, really good work. Um, and thank you. I really appreciate you inviting me to kind of speak at the end. Um, I've just got uh, a very short presentation. Um, as I'm sure there's quite a few questions for David as well. Um, and thank you, Eddie. Um, but yeah, uh, my name is Tom. I'm um, the Sport Relations Officer at uh, the Architects Benevolence Society. Um, this, uh, we are a charity that, uh, as Eddie had said, uh, helps the, those working in the wider architectural professions and their families in times of need. Uh, we've been around for the last uh, 170 years. Um, but I just thought first off, um, to kind of give you an idea of, uh, of how we help, it's good to have some kind of case examples. Um, I like to think of ABS as being uh, the charity is there for you and there for our community uh, when you kind of least expect you need it. Um, so first off, uh, this is um, Ian. Ian is a landscape architect. Um, he came to us um, and, and wasn't expecting to have quite a serious accident on his bike uh, where he needed uh, to recover. Um, he came to us at that period where we were able to financially support him while he was recovering. Um, and uh, then went on to support him and provide specialist medical equipment uh, like the wheelchair you can see um, in the photo. Um, this is the Lowe family. Uh, the Lowe family didn't expect uh, for their youngest to uh, get diagnosed with a health condition, which meant he needed around the clock uh, care uh, and supervision. Um, so uh, the, the mother had to um, leave her job and we were able to support them ongoingly with, um, with, with a financial grant. Um, and lastly, um, this is Priya. Uh, Priya came to us during a period of uh, quite high stress and anxiety. Uh, and we were able to support her uh, to have sessions with our partner, uh, Anxiety UK. Um, she's gone on to become one of our ambassadors and is actually a real good champion of our work and speaks a lot about us. So she's one of our heroes too. Um, so who do we help? Uh, as the name suggests, we just help architects. That is not true. Um, as Eddie has said already, uh, we help architects, we help landscape architects, we help architectural assistants, um, architectural technologists, uh, families and students. Um, I think it's probably important just to say in the context, especially of the presentation you've just seen, uh, that we help students, but it's a slightly more limited uh, support. Um, I will, actually, I might as well talk a little bit. So we are able to give, um, access to uh, the, um, the, the app uh, Headspace, um, as well as a dedicated uh, email support and phone support to students. Um, but we have eligibility of one year's working experience within the design process uh, within the UK to be eligible for our full support. Um, uh, yeah, so but I can explain that more if you have any more questions. Um, so how we help, uh, we uh, give advice, support and um, uh, experience in kind of money and debt, housing advice, uh, uh, mental health and well-being, employment and physical health and disability. 
We're also, um, I think, really lucky to have uh, Helen, Aidan and Deirdre, who are kind of the face of our charity, I, I like to think. Um, they're our welfare team. And they're the ones that you, if you ever needed support from us uh, and picked up the phone and gave us a ring or sent us an email, they're the ones you'll get through to. Um, Helen and Aidan, our welfare officers, uh, both have backgrounds for years working as social workers. Um, and they have actually both worked at ABS for about 10 years each. Uh, so they have really good knowledge and uh, specific advice about how to uh, give people who come from our community and work in our backgrounds. Um, so yeah, I feel really lucky to have them. Um, this is our campaign that we're running this year. Uh, it's our foundation of support campaign. Uh, we're really asking people to tell a friend, tell a colleague, tell a family member um, about it and uh, about us really. Uh, it coincides with a, a big piece of work we did at the end of last year and all through to 2020 uh, to redevelop our social communications and better inform people about the different support that is available. Um, and it's launched with a new website. So I really encourage you to go to our website, absnet.org um, and uh, have a look through as there's some great resources there. Um, it was kind of inspired off the back of our, the campaign we ran before, which was hashtag anxiety arch, um, which uh, really highlighted the support we have around mental health support. Uh, but we wanted then to continue this and like create a dialogue and talk about the other um, forms of support that's there. I will say again with the Anxiety Arch, it's really great as there's some really great resources and a lot of people have shared their experience uh, working within architecture and uh, mental health and like uh, came together to kind of sh share a lot of articles and blog posts, um, which is on there. Um, but we're now looking to, to kind of extend that into, um, into our other support services. So I'm just going to play, if that's okay, a quick video. Um, it's about our campaign. Uh, I will give a word of warning, it's a little bit loud. Uh, so if you've got headphones in, you might want to just turn it down just before I press play, because I've, I've had some uh, <laughs> some shocks in the past, but um, I hope you enjoy it. Um, yeah. Dear colleagues and friends, this year the Architects Benevolent Society is celebrating having been a foundation of support for the architectural community and their families for 170 years. Since becoming ABS president in 2018, I have seen really positive advances being made. ABS has forged new partnerships with organisations that can help people, for example, take control of their finances, and have been involved in events that have raised awareness and attracted vital funds that provide a lifeline to those who need it. Some years ago, in 2003, I became patron of ABS, following on from Princess Margaret, who was a great supporter. I hope that you will feel you can support this charity because it doesn't wish to be restrictive on those it helps, but to be flexible, personal and responsive. Its necessity is greater in these difficult times than ever before. So as patron of ABS, I see it as a foundation that I wish to support. The ABS has been around since 1850 when we were founded in the Freemasons Tavern. And since that time, we've helped many thousands of people in terms of individuals and their families. Indeed, last year, 2019, we helped nearly 1,200 people. One of the things we're going to be launching this year is our Foundation of Support campaign. And this is going to tell people all about the services we provide, which cover the areas such as money and debt, employment, housing, mental health, physical health and disability. Of course, asking for help can be difficult. But it only takes one call. ABS is here when things become hard to cope with and can help prevent them spiralling out of control. So I am a project architect for a company called MACE and throughout my career there's been moments where I've experienced personal and professional struggles. So I reached out to the ABS. Within a couple of days I got a call back from them and received really dedicated counselling support which gave me a better perspective and appreciation for my career. 
ABS is my foundation of support. 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 Great. Got a good coverage there of Northern Ireland, I'd say. Uh, <laughs> um, just lastly, uh, I'll just talk about some of the ways if you wanted to support us um, to look out for. Um, we run quite a few events. People put on events in, in aid of us. Um, but these are some of the ones we run as a charity. Um, during May, we have Bake the World a Better Place, where we encourage practices to take uh, a bit of time from their day. Um, and do some baking, have a wee bake sale, uh, maybe do a little bit of fundraising for us at the same time. We try to uh, coordinate it all at the same time and uh, get, send out a pack of like uh, support really during that bit. Um, obviously COVID depending uh, if we can, otherwise there might be a virtual option of this too. Uh, in July, August, we do the chicken run. This was all virtual last year and we had a really great turnout of people uh, doing a bit of a 5k fun run, doing some other kind of fun, uh, uh, physical activities, um, but also doing a bit of fundraising for us at the same time. And it was it was great. I don't know why it's called the Chicken Run, but um, everyone dresses up as chickens, and uh, it's a yeah bit of fun. Uh, time for sketch, uh, really obvious one for helping our community. As there's some amazing artists out there, uh, it's a national drawing competition where people take part in September uh, around a the theme that we release on the day. Uh, Taken out their day, do a bit of drawing, and then we have a panel of judges who kind of choose the best ones or their favourite ones. And then lastly, we have um, our Christmas quiz uh, around Christmas time. We were really great to have um, Eddie as one of our uh, hosts that year. Um, but we had uh, representatives from the Landscape Institute and from Reba as well. Um, and it's, it's really fun. Some great, um, yeah, great, great feedback on that. And it's something we want to make a regular event uh, going forward. Um, and then lastly, yeah, corporate support. Um, if you know a practice or a company that might want to support ABS, please let me know. Um, we have some great benefits we can offer back in return, um, and it's a great way to show a bit of uh, corporate uh, social responsibility too. Um, um, more important, most importantly, it just helps us continue to do the work we do. Um, yeah, so thank you so much. Uh, that's my email address. Uh, please visit our website. Um, probably should have put our helpline number there too, but uh, I'm sure you can find it on our website uh, afterwards. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, that's amazing. That's great. Uh, we've a, a couple of minutes. I'm just going to give everybody a, a wee opportunity if anybody has any questions. Uh, if you have, could you please hit the raise hand uh, function and um, turn your video and unmute yourselves, please? I'll give you a couple of wee minutes if anybody there wants to, to say anything before I close. Okay, I think I think we're clear. Um, just do we check? Okay, these are all. Oh, we have uh, Jade uh, Henry. Jade, if you want to uh, ask your wee question directly, there, go ahead. Uh, hi there. First of all, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, it was really insightful, and very informative. Um, I'm a 2020 graduate and I've experienced quite a lot of, um, I've had a few interviews and a couple of knockbacks uh, despite leaving uni with quite a high mark and um, uh, an award. I'm just wondering if you've got any advice or words of wisdom from, for the kind of 2020 graduates, especially during COVID, it's been quite tough. Um, yeah, if you've just got any advice or words of, words of wisdom really. <laughs> Uh, I'll pass that to David. Hi, Jade. Thanks for um, for your question. I suppose it's it is so difficult. I'll maybe answer this more of uh, an academic and from my own experience, maybe um, aside from the the publication. So again, what I would tell my students is that you said you know you're a graduate, you've got a, a pretty good maybe degree classification from what you've said there. And I would say that will always shine true. That from even from the graduates from our course last year, um, you know, the vast majority have managed to secure something, even though 
the circumstances have been so challenging. So I know and I appreciate not everybody is in, is in that position, in that fortunate position. But I think, you know, if you are, if you have achieved your degree classification, you have got a good portfolio there. Yes, it may take longer than you would hope, but I would be, be very hopeful that someone will want to snap you up. What I would suggest is, and this is something advice I would give to all my own students, how it's so important to have a really strong social media presence, especially LinkedIn presence. Um, you know, you're the best person to to sell yourself, to sell your own skill sets, to, to show and demonstrate the, the work that you can do. So I would really utilize the likes of LinkedIn, um, Instagram as well, or Twitter. The more platforms, the better. I would create a, an e-portfolio of your work as well that can be sent around different firms and you know i keep telling this to my students and sometimes they don't believe me until they actually do it you would be surprised who actually would pick that up in, in different parts of the world or in different countries you know just something as simple as that and um, continue to develop your skills if you're in the position where you, you can't secure anything yet and um, i would be looking for certainly within northern ireland there's things like at the minute um, passive house training course where you can go on a two-week course. You can become a certified um, passive house designer, essentially, um, at the end of it, and just continue to develop and build your CV. If you do that and sort of promote yourself, I think that's all you can do. And I would be hopeful that you know your, your the skills you have will will come through. Um, I don't know, Eddie, even from your perspective as an employer, is there anything else that you, you could add to that or suggest? Yeah. You, you, what a fabulous question, but but what a fabulous response, David. It's just uh, give yourself as many opportunities to showcase your talents. You know, from from sitting, looking and judging um, some of the awards that we have in our ATA awards every year, and I see the quality of, of some of our students' work. And, and when, when we say it's a fabulous time to be an AT, our industry thrives and needs um, ATs to be able to function. So it's a great time to be an AT. Keep showing your skills to as many people. Obviously, with COVID and the way the world is at the moment, and uh, and unemployment probably being so so high, um, it it may take a wee bit longer just to get yourself into place. But stick with it. Uh, it's there for you. Just to uh, follow up on that, I could probably talk to you offline, Jade, um, in a lot more detail. But things like I would tell my students in the past, they have um, volunteered to work say for free for two weeks and the employer has been that impressed that they've rung me up and said I'm actually embarrassed that this person's working for free I'm starting to pay them and I'm going to offer them a position or a part-time position because they're so good so you know things like that thinking outside the box um there was something else I was going to say there that's that's um slipped my mind but if, if you want to have a chat after this and outside of this Jade I'm more than happy to, to try and advise you there's a really good um LinkedIn or, or Facebook site the architecture social um that's a guy I forget his name but he's got really really good tips on developing your CV and portfolio and getting jobs so feel free to reach out to me after this and we can we can have a chat Stephen Drew. Stephen Drew. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jade. Uh, Tom Gray. Tom, you want to unmute uh, and show yourself and ask your wee question there? That'd be great. Thank you very much, Eddie. And fantastic sort of evening presentation is really good, and I sort of support this wholeheartedly. I just wanted to ask from Tom to another Tom uh, about ABS and how how w what is it that makes an ambassador? And because I I have been through exactly what this whole evening has been about in terms of signed off with stress and anxiety and had to leave my previous job because of it and related to everything that David said but how do how does someone become an ambassador if they want to support you so sort of from their own experiences having not actually used your services but maybe thinking we could give something back yeah um great question i uh, i did have a bit in this but i took it out because i wasn't sure how much time <laughs> i had um, but uh, we're always looking for um you know uh, for good people to, to kind of expand um we uh our ambassador program kind of started about four years ago now originally we had a lot of people kind of like the way that you you guys are speaking wanted to support us and kind of informally were doing that through through fundraising through awareness raising uh, through speaking at different events about us and making sure people were heard about us. Um, we just wanted uh, my predecessor, Mark, and I've come into the role in the last in the last year and a half um, to 
formalize that and to recognize ambassadors and try and uh, create a group. So now we have uh, over 70 um, ambassadors working around the country who support us. Um, uh, please, yeah, feel free to write to me if you were, yeah, I'm, I'm, um, if there's something that you'd be interested in. Uh, we normally, um, so we have people who volunteer for us if they can, but if they're able to give a bit more time, that's kind of when they would enter the ambassador program. And it's normally like a commitment of about two to three hours. Um, but I, I can speak about this in more detail, but it's it's very varied and we have different ambassadors who are able to help us in different ways. Um, uh, but yeah, it's just, um, it's just I guess um, you sound like you'd be a really good fit for the role and I'm always looking for, yeah, for, for more people, so. <laughs> Fantastic, I'll drop, I'll drop you an email. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, great question, Tom. Um, uh, so, so in, initially, when the ambassadors program had, had been sort of rolled out, we thought it was very, very important, uh, first and foremost, to to raise awareness, um, because I, I think once you sort of raise awareness, uh, whenever we were doing the fundraising side of things, we we were getting uh, sort of comments like. Uh, Architects Benevolence Society doing a fundraiser, so you use of a license to print your own money. Um, and it was pure ignorance because nobody really had a total understanding of, of what the fabulous work that they did. What the ambassadors uh, have been doing is, is been um, educating everybody and raising the awareness of the fabulous work that they do. Um, and then from that, uh, the fundraising actually becomes a lot easier once uh, those people that you're, you're looking to sort of contribute to uh, know the wonderful work that they do. So, uh, no, they do a fantastic, a fantastic job. And you know what? It's great fun. Uh, everybody who who is in the ambassador program, um, we're all friends, uh, and we all get an opportunity every year to to get together uh, and share sort of experiences. So yes, I I would recommend it wholeheartedly. Um, we our next hand is uh, John Stinson. John, if you want to unmute and and uh, turn your camera on and ask your wee question, go ahead. Okay. Good good evening, gentlemen, uh, and a fantastic presentation. I hope you can hear me well. Um, yep, thanks, thanks, Eddie, David, Tom, brilliant. Uh, and I've just during the some of the questions there, I've been I found the document online and I've uh, followed your QR code. And we've signed up to that as well. So I'm a, I'm a tad I'm a tad embarrassed that I'm only finding this document now, but I'm I'm glad I'm glad we found it. Some excellent stuff. Now I haven't had a chance to read it entirely, but uh, um, I'm looking forward to getting into a bit more detail and sharing it with some of my network. Who weren't able to be here tonight but i've just got i've got kind of two questions if that's okay and then i'll i'll disappear and let everyone get on with it afternoon or evening rather um the first question um probably probably goes to, to david more so as a as an academic as it's around um university and the split of learning time and then the second question is um, if there's a couple of things that have been considered by the committee or by the task force rather uh, if they were considered and uh, and what the decision was there. Now, they may be in this document. I've just had a quick control F. I may be looking for the wrong words, but I haven't found it. I'm just curious if if that's that's been discussed. So the first question is, I'm thinking more about the the students in, in financial hardships, you know, students who come from a background where they may be the first student to go to university in their family. They may be, as you said, David, you know, fantastic example. They're working every hour under the sun to beat to you know, put themselves to university. And they may not, as often the case is, they may not be in an industry specific job. So it doesn't actually augment any of the learning. I was just curious if within the um, framework, within the, the, the kind of um, checklist you have there for stage, I think it was stage two, David, which was education level. I was wondering if you had considered that uh, split. So in, in the classroom, you have a certain number of hours, the student has to be there, and then you have that independent learning time frame. And that independent learning is, is supposed to be filled up by the days the students aren't in the classroom or aren't, aren't on campus. But for those students who are you know, out working in the service sector, trying to, to, get, mo trying to get money in to, to cover their time, what would the what were the kind of words of wisdom, or as as Jade had had mentioned, what would be the advice to those who don't always get the uh, the time to do the independent learning uh, and trying to put themselves to university? Because that can be a very uh, a very 
poignant part of the anxiety spiral. Hi, John. Thanks. It's good to good to chat to you again, first first and foremost, and, and thanks for your question. And actually, before I come on to it, you make a really good point that this was, I suppose, published about probably about a year ago now, or maybe March 2020. And whilst in one way it sort of coincided with, with COVID and everything else, and that was good that there was support out there, what we did find is that just understandably employers that received this, they were just too busy and there was too much going on. They were trying to, to sort out their, their employees and working from home and remote working and everything else. And sort of maybe the, the sign, signing up to this publication got put to one side and sort of was forgotten about. So I think it, it's really important to, to have events like this, to promote it again, to share it and to ask people to sign up because it's something students could use as well. You know, they're looking at this document, they're seeing who has signed up to it, and they think to themselves, actually, this organization has taken the time to listen to this presentation, to read the document, to sign up to it. You know, to me, that shows something in itself. So just I thought it was useful to say that. In terms of your question, we do within the document, we do sort of acknowledge that first and family. Um, and whilst we say it's, it's a brilliant thing, you know, obviously, uh, making education accessible um it presents a number of challenges as you have outlined and even within the, the network of those students that they're first in family and they don't have that maybe friend network who have went to university to chat the things about so there's there's numerous issues in and along with that um in terms of the the employment it's so so difficult you know if, if I would say to students, you know, in the ideal world, yes, this is a full time course. You're spending 34, four, five hours per week studying, doing your own independent study at home. But I'm also more than aware that in the real world, that isn't always going to happen. And listen, I am one of those people that if I didn't work during my studies at the weekends and the evenings, I wouldn't have been able to go to university because I wouldn't have been able to afford it. Um, so. I'm coming from that perspective where I'm, I'm sort of towing the party line and saying this is what you're expected to do, but have that understanding that it doesn't always happen. And again, ideally, we would try and ask the students to try and find work related to their studies in some way. But again, especially in, in COVID times, we know that's not always possible. But sort of flipping that around, to me, if that's what a student has to do to get through, as long as they can sort of manage their time and have realistic ambitions that they're not going to never say never, but they're probably not going to score 70, 80 percent in each module if they haven't got the time to, to put into it. So it's being realistic. But, you know, I'm always a great believer in, the, yes, academic achievement is great. But to me, being personable, people skills, soft skills are as equal, if not more important, whenever you're, you're searching for jobs. And I would, um, you know, if I was still in industry, hire someone with yeah, a good degree qualification, but how they come across an interview, their enthusiasm, commitment, work ethic, that type of thing, it would be equally important to me. So I suppose what I'm trying to say is, it, well, no matter what job role you're in, um, you know, employers are looking for that, that you're a hard worker, you're committed, that you're, um, enthusiastic etc cetera, etc cetera. And, and those skills can be built really within any setting so it's, it's trying just to, to encourage that and every student will have a, an individual situation so it's just trying to, to help them as best we can bit of a long-winded answer but um hopefully that's covered uh, some of the points super thanks thanks david and then just uh just finally um uh i just want to another question there and it's about again having read the document and you're very proud to be part of an organization that uh, that commissions and produces documents of this nature it's, it's a fantastic step forward for us so the next question is in terms of those mental health percentages and those stats that you had showed david you know some very scary stuff there and some behind some of those stats is the the number of people who are being prescribed uh, drugs and medication for anxiety and stuff like that, which has a huge list of side effects that they can be quite dangerous in and in themselves and, and not really affects by any stretch of imagination. But I was just wondering if, um, again, within the within the task force, within the committee, in terms of the um, the recommendations went forward, was there any discussion given to perhaps ways to incentivize uh, micro SMEs or small SME com companies 
to um, grease the wheels, kind of, to take on to take on graduates or take on um, students who have had a hard time finding a position, something like that. Uh, other question is, did you consider um, mandating, almost mandating holidays or having techno detox weeks? So whenever um, staff are on holidays, they, they're not allowed to sign into the servers and not allowed to go into emails and stuff like that, because as you said, the start digital, you know, the, the, the wave and the magnitude of the digital content can be a, a huge trigger. Uh, and also access to you know cognitive, this may be a question more so to, to Tom, but access to you know cognitive behavior therapy, talk therapy. So sometimes just getting the problem out can can really um, can really put the problem into perspective and, and make it easier to find a, a workaround. So those you may have solutions in that document, but just wondering if they were discussed and, and what the kind of thoughts were. And uh, final point before I hand over, David. You mentioned there was a, a, a website um, that was useful to go to. Uh, also, there's a, a LinkedIn group called Collabed, which are also are uh, making some waves in that area in terms of helping students find positions. So just again, letting the attendees know there's more there's more out there. If I, thanks. I, thanks. If I Sorry, just, Addy, go ahead. I like I just um, we're losing people because the time has been over. Uh, if you could just just wee brief answers and, and maybe John, we could follow up with, with the answers uh, maybe by email or so. Uh, we went over the R slightly and I know people are getting impatient. So uh, as a good chair, uh, I just want to rein it in a wee bit. Uh, just a wee brief response to those, uh, David and Tom, and then we'll close for tonight. Thanks, Ari. I'll just briefly mention a couple of them. Yeah, I think that the study drugs was something that maybe was new to me whenever I was working on this. I wasn't overly familiar with that, and certainly it's, it's, it seems to be um, about turning into a bit of an issue that we, I need to, to learn more about it, really, before I can comment on it. And in terms of the, the SMEs, I suppose what we were trying to do was to give quick wins put up posters, embed sort of mental well-being within the discussion and interview and then sort of build on that with this publication and then maybe reach out and, and hold more in-depth discussions. In terms of the, the holidays, the emails, it does mention that for even, you know, employers looking after their own mental well-being and managing emails and having policies in that regard. So it's something that is so, so important. So it is touched on, but again, there's more work can be done and there's, there's probably possibilities to develop this work further and have a, a follow-up publication, but I'll maybe just leave it there um, and hand over to Tom quickly. Yeah, um, just I guess to touch on, maybe it'd be useful if you're talking about cognitive therapy or, or our approach at ABS, um, I'll briefly maybe speak a bit about our referral process um, for uh, mental health support. Um, as you can imagine, we do normally do a, a financial check on a lot of our services to make sure, as well as the eligibility tech, um, people are, um, uh, are, are in need of the support, uh, but with mental health support, we consider this to be an urgent need. So we don't do a financial check and it goes straight um, to one of our uh, assessment team. Um, they will then, uh, as long as they pass the eligibility, will uh, refer straight on to Anxiety UK, who is our partner, uh, a mental health <laughs> charity. They've been going around since 1970s and have a network of, I think, over 300 trained uh, counsellors and uh, therapists across the country. Uh, they're able to do um, over the phone, uh, video chat or in-person uh, sessions. And um, it's then really between them uh, and the person who needs support uh, if they want cognitive behavioral therapy, if they want counseling. Uh, I think there's even like uh, acupuncture as an option or a few other alternative methods too. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but that kind of just gives you an idea of uh, what the ABS support and, it's, uh, and how we help in that regard. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, what a wonderful event. Uh, and a huge thank you again to David and Tom for being so articulate as always. Uh, and it's always a pleasure uh, to work alongside you. I, I hope and trust that tonight's event drives home the importance of mental health first aid and that the support is there for those who need it. Thank you to everyone from near and far who has joined us this evening. And for those who would like to be involved and hear more about our EDI task force, we really do look forward to hearing from you. There is a pretty amazing opportunity for you if this is something that you're interested in to be further involved with your institute. Thank you everyone who were all involved in setting up tonight's event and of course to Adam Endicott and our amazing CIAT staff. 
What a fabulous time it is to be an AT. Please take care, stay safe, look after each other. And I really do uh, hope and look forward to seeing you all in person sometime soon. You're all amazing. Thank you and good night.